and we're going to start with the first one from uh, Dr. Yorieva Payano regarding the fetal thoracic MRI. And I'm giving uh, the, uh, uh, to Yorieva to start. Good morning, dear colleagues, dear president. Uh, I'm very excited and happy to be part of this forum. Uh, and I would like to thank the organizing committee uh, for the honor. I'm a pediatric radiologist, and my topic today will be fetal thoracic MRI. We all know that uh, prenatal ultrasonography is the gold standard for the screening of the fetus. But during the past few decades, uh, fetal MRI has uh, made uh, significant steps due to the advent of MRI technology, but also the uh, advent of uh, fetal medicine. So fetal MRI currently is a valuable supplement to uh, prenatal ultrasonography because it can clarify uh, anomalies that are detected uh, by ultrasound in complex cases. It also adds uh, um, significant information regarding anatomy and function that affect treatment and uh, pregnancy uh, outcome. It's not long ago that the first report uh, of fetal MRI uh, was published back in 1983, but back then images uh, were not as uh, were used uh, to the current images. They were, were very blurred, uh, deprived, uh, degraded from uh, fetal motion. But nearly um, around 90s, uh, the launch of single shot sequences has changed uh, fetal MRI. There are some uh, concerns regarding safety of uh, scanning fetuses with MRI, but worldwide there is no acknowledgeable uh, risk uh, if the fetus is scanned during the second or the third trimester. Um, we don't use contrast agents and very few uh, countries use maternal anesthesia. And research, uh, recent studies have uh, proved that uh, if uh, we check uh, children at preschool age that have been under, uh, went uh, undergone uh, fetal MRI as fetuses, uh, they don't have associated anomalies of function or acoustic injury. And actually, um, when we compare MRI with antenatal ultrasound, there are some advantages. MRI has excellent contrast resolution that uh, help us um, characterize tissues and delineate lesions uh, compared to adjacent structures. It has, it has a larger field of view than ultrasound, so we can um, view the fetus as a whole. And in case of lungs, we can assess uh, lung volumes. And it exploits motion to assess some normal function. And this particular fetus, um, you may um, uh, see uh, the swallowing procedure as it swallows amniotic fluid. So all these images are friendly when we review them retrospectively with uh, the clinicians, um, more than uh, the sonographic static images. However, there are some disadvantages that have to do with the, the fact that this is expen an expensive modality and mothers are usually not that satisfied as when they undergo ultrasound because they um, uh, have a, an increased psychological stress. And um, additionally to that, spatial resolution is still lower than ultrasound because the fetus lies deeply and um, far away from the surface color, co coil. I will not get into details with uh, imaging protocols, but I will stress that we use these fantastic single shot images that freeze fetal motion in three different planes of the area that we examine. And um, depending on uh, what we uh, see, we may add some other sequences. We may add T1-weighted images uh, to um, uh, see where the bowel loops lie or where, where the liver, uh, the fetal liver uh, lies and what are its features. We may add T2 star images to identify feeding vessels. And we may also have a diffusion weighting imaging to assess uh, lung maturity. And in order to understand what is abnormal, we need to know what normal looks like. Uh, this is a normal fetus. 
and this is how the fetal lungs look like. They have an intermediate sing signal uh, in T2 uh, weighted images. T2 images are the ones that the amniotic fluid is bright. So we assess the volume, uh, the configuration, and the homogeneity of the fetal lungs. We can also see the hemidiaphragms. We may even see the vasculature of the fetal lungs. And this is the intraventricular septum. And uh, if we look closer, we may identify structures that are, are filled with fluid, like trachea and main bronchi, in different planes. Um, however, um, indication for fetal MRI in general and um, uh, fetal thoracic MRI are not clear yet. Uh, recently, the European Task Force uh, published a paper that uh, revealed that there is increased diversity on uh, fetal MRI indications in different countries, and then that usually relies on the differences that different countries have in uh, legislation regarding termination of pregnancy, but also differences in protocols and expertise uh, on um, antenatal ultrasound and fetal MRI. By the way, this is our scanner in Mitera Hospital, an open high-field MRI scanner that makes um, a scanning of pregnant women uh, more pleasant. So uh, when shall we perform fetal thoracic MRI? Uh, unlike uh, CNS anomalies that uh, may uh, uh, be um, indicated for a fetal MRI if there is a familiar uh, chromosomal uh, problem, uh, in the chest, uh, our indications are always related to ultrasound. Either we have a suboptimal ultrasound because of different reasons. On the left, you see uh, a case of oligohydramnios, or we have an abnormal sonographic finding. And usually, uh, the finding, uh, the abnormal uh, sonographic finding in the chest is an area of hyperechogenicity, which looks like that. And it may be associated with a significant mediastinal shift. So we will perform fetal MRI to characterize this lesion and also characterize what the normal lung looks like, because these lesions may affect the adjacent lung, causing either reduced lung volume or, or hyperexpansion. Starting with the fetal, congenital fetal lung lesions, with, which are not that rare, there are some uh, uh, common offenders and some less common offenders. I will uh, guide you through some examples. This is a fetal at 23 weeks gestational age with a lung hypercogenicity on ultrasound and significant mediastinal shift. We performed MRI and we confirmed that there is an area of abnormal signal intention in the left lower lung, which is hyperexpanded. Um, we, this is the adjacent normal lung that has a um, satisfactory volume. There is a slight mediastinal, mediastinal shift, so uh, we diagnose it as a congenital pulmonary airway malformation. The baby was born, there was slight hyperexpansion of the left lung, and when the uh, baby was stabilized, um, we performed a CT of the lungs. We performed the CT in our department with, with control ventilation technique. We don't have to use general anesthesia, and we scan during inspiration. So we get very uh, detailed imaging of the abnormality. You see the abnormality with uh, the emphysematous cysts, and we may perform MPRs to uh, map uh, the anatomy and the extension, and that is used for pre-surgical planning. Another fetus that was uh, referred because of a cogenic lesion with a uh, large cysts within it, and we performed MRI to differentiate whether that was a mediastinal lesion such as a mediastinal teratoma or a lung lesion. A fetal MRI confirmed that it was within the lung with a, a macrocystic appearance. And when the baby perform, uh, was, was born and we performed CT, a macrocystic CPAM was confirmed. Another fetus with hyperechogenicity in the lung and a, a feeding, feeding vessel on ultrasound, MRI confirmed the presence of uh, an abnormal lung lesion at the lower part of the lung lung, which depressed uh, the hemidiaphragm. We didn't identify back then uh, a feeding vessel, but when the baby was born and CT was performed, this lesion was confirmed, and we identified a fine feeding vessel coming from celiac axis. So 
that was also confirmed on VR reformats, and that was a sequestration. Another similar case with hyperechoic lesion and ultrasound in a feeding vessel. We confirmed the lesion on MR. We identified the feeding vessel with D2-star imaging. But when the baby was born, we identified some uh, parenchymal uh, emphysematous cysts adjacent uh, to that area of sequestration. And obviously, uh, we uh, demonstrated the feeding artery and the draining, draining vessels of the sequestration, but that was characterized as a hybrid lesion. And that is uh, usually the case uh, now that we examine these fetuses uh, with CT. Uh, another fetus with hypercogenicity of the lung and significant mediastinal shift. Uh, MRI confirmed the lung lesion. You may appreciate the fine vasculature uh, within the lesion. Uh, these uh, fetuses are followed up during third trimester with ultrasound. Most of the congenital le lung lesions uh, tend to decrease in, sign, in size, um, but this particular one increased. So when a CT was performed, we identified an area of hyperlucency. You may um, appreciate the stretching of the vasculars, the, the vessels of the lungs within the lesion. So that is a congenital lobe of an overinflation, a previously called emphysema. We need to follow up these uh, children because uh, these fetuses, because uh, during gestation these lesions may enlarge causing uh, fetal hydrops and jeopardizing uh, the fetal outcome. And actually, when we performed uh, the CT in this uh, neonate, we identified uh, on virtual bronchoscopy this uh, very stenotic uh, segmental bronchus that was the cause for this area of overinflation. Another fetus with echogenic lung lesion and mediastinal shift. Again, we identify the lesion on MRI, but we also noticed that there was a, um, a central structure that was not branching within the lesion. When the baby was born, this area was confirmed as area of hyperlucency, and we saw this solid structure within it, which looked like a bronchocele. So that is a case of bronchial atresia, and we need to identify these fetuses and follow them up because sometimes uh, these uh, stricture bronchi uh, develop um, uh, a mass effect and the overexpansion of the lung that may end up with uh, fetal hydrops and uh, poor outcome uh, for the fetus. Congenital lung tumors are very rare. They don't have specific imaging findings, but our imaging clue is that they were not usually present during the second trimester anatomy scan. So if we see a lesion that looks like what we already have discussed, but grows during the uh, third trimester, develops hydrops in the fetus, and it doesn't respond to mat uh, maternal steroids, then we should think of congenital lung tumors. So when we see on uh, imaging uh, congenital lung lesion, we need to answer some crucial questions. Does it harm the adjacent lung, causing uh, either a, a overinflation or a hypoplasia? Is there a feeding vessel, so do we call it a sequestration or a hybrid lesion? Could it be a tumor? And obviously, does it cause severe mediastinal shift or airway obstruction that may end up in fetal hydrops? MRI has the ability to answer the, these questions accurately because of the multiplanar imaging, the um, ability to give us a detailed anatomy and superb contrast resolution. And more, um, and more than these, on MRI we can make uh, actual uh, volumetric uh, calculations. We can measure the volume of the lung lesion and follow it up, and we can measure the volume of the lungs and uh, compared to the expected volumes for gestational age. So we can select the fetuses that need close surveillance and in uterine intervention. Another fetus that was referred to as from ultrasound because of significant mediastinal shift, we confirmed that on MRI, but we noticed that the right lung was hyperexpanded, herniating um, across the midline to the left. We couldn't identify a left lung, and uh, it, that was uh, a constant uh, finding on uh, any, uh, any plane. This is the sagittal plane, this is the stomach, and no lung above it. 
And uh, when we performed T to star, we couldn't identify a structure looking like a left pulmonary artery. So this is a case of left lung hyperplasia. Obviously, there are some uh, entities that may mimic uh, fetal lung lesions, of which the commonest being congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This is a fetus referred to us uh, with a multicystic lesion of the left hemithorax and significant mediastinal seat that was confirmed on MRI, but on a sagittal plane, we identified a gap in uh, the hemidiaphragm, so that was not a CPAM, as thought before, that was um, a, a congenital diaphragmatic hernia with the stomach being at its regular place. But when we performed T1-weighted images, we identified bowel loops herniating in the left hemithorax. Another fetus that was referred for congenital diaphragmatic hernia, uh, when we scanned these fetuses with MRI, we need to identify what herniates in the hemithorax. Here are the bowel loops. And we also measure the volume of the uh, lung that is compressed by the hernia and the contralateral lung. We identify mediastinal shift, and we may even uh, proceed to uh, fetal colonography using T1 sequences. This is the uh, portion of the large bowel herniating in the large hemithorax in this um, fetus. And obviously, we identify some signs that make prognosis worse for these uh, fetuses. If we see liver herniating in, in the hemithorax, prognosis is worse. If we identify stomach in the left in the hemithorax, or a significant amount of bowel loops causing um, uh, lung hyperplasia. And our last case is a right um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and you may see additional herniation of the liver in the left hemithorax. When that baby was born, a uh, plain film looked like that. There was severe uh, lung hyperplasia, and eventually uh, the baby developed uh, chronic lung disease. So we performed fetal MRI to predict the outcome of fetuses with congenital diaphragmatic hernia regarding uh, lung hyperplasia and development of chronic lung disease. And uh, we are based on volumetric lung calculations, observed to expected the uh, fetal lung volume. If that uh, goes uh, be, uh, lower than one fourth, then survival is poor. Uh, there, are high there is high chance of developing chronic lung disease and a requirement of ECMO. So we uh, select the fetuses that need special care and we refer them to special centers. Uh, rarely we may uh, identify bilateral uh, expansion of the lungs in KO syndrome where there is a high uh, airway obstruction and MRI may show the dilated trachea and identify the level of obstruction. Uh, we may also notice the inverted hemidiaphragms and the um, uh, fetal ascites, and these fetuses need uh, usually intrauterine um, um, uh, treatment. Um, this is what the histology specimen looks like, and we may identify the level of the stricture. Sometimes lesions are not within the lung, but they are in the mediastinum. Uh, on the left, we have a fetus referred for a large mediastinal lesion uh, on MRI. We identified a homogeneous structure that did not display uh, vessels or airways. It did not uh, uh, compress the lungs, and that was a normal thymus, normal variant. And on the right, we see a cystic structure thought to be a lymphangioma. Actually, lymphatic malformations should be scanned with MRI because they tend to enlarge, sometimes they hemorrhage, and compress uh, the trachea. This is the trachea just displays in this instance. We uh, image them in different planes in order to plan um, the delivery and uh, the um, perinatal uh, treatment. In uh, certain ce centers, these um, uh, babies are delivered uh, with an exit procedure. Uh, half the baby is delivered, intubated before the uh, umbilical cord uh, is uh, cut. And then they can safely be uh, transferred to the MRI suite for um, an MRI that will uh, provide the surgical planning. So we perform fetal thoracic MRI to identify and confirm, characterize, and delineate lesions that have been identified with ultrasound. We may assess the lesion of uh, the, the volume of the lesion, the volume of the lung, and the parenchymal maturity. 
If we see systemic arterial supply, we uh, may suspect a sequestration and a, or a hybrid lesion. If we see a homogeneous lesion with a bronchocele, then we should suggest bronchial atresia. Uh, we are aware of congenital diaphragmatic hernias and chaos syndrome, and we are concerned if we see a severe mass effect with flattening of the diaphragm and diastinal shift, compression of the lung or hydrops. We identify these fetuses, we, we follow them up closely, and we plan either perinatal and postnatal treatment. MR, fetal MRI gives us an accurate diagnosis and characterization and helps us with uh, perinatal management and pregnancy counseling. Ultrasound remains the modality of choice for uh, imaging the fetuses, but MRI has a significant supplementary role for diagnosing and therapeutic purposes. We continue uh, to collaborate with each other, uh, several subspecialties for these difficult uh, fetuses, and we are expecting more for fetal MRI in the near future. Our technology still evolves. Uh, three Tesla, postmortem MRI, virtual bronchoscopy, identification of structures that we thought that we couldn't discern antenatally. Finally, I would like to stress the importance of imaging these fetuses postnatally because then we can identify all the findings that uh, draw our attention on uh, fetal MRI. Thank you very much. Dr. Papayano, thank you very much for your uh, lecture. It was a uh, very detailed and very scientific uh, program. I would like to continue with our next lecturer.